And then Ooh, here they all come. Let's see if Roger's the first one to uh, speak. Oh, hello, hello. <laughs> hello, Roger. Hello. <laughs> Evening all. First one as per usual. Hello, Mike. Hi, Hi Rob. Mike. Hi, Hiya. Hi, uh... Hi, Nick. Hi, Nick. How are you doing, folks? Are you doing okay? Hi. Good evening. That's Hello. It. Hello. Hello. Hi, Nick. Hi, Pat. Yeah, yeah, I'm fine, thank you. Not too bad. I'm uh, keeping a check on to see if uh, Starship Nine is about to go off. Now I've got it on oh, the well other done. screen here. I'm keeping an eye yeah. out. But it and, I, and I also yet. see that uh, Starlink is going up at about eleven o'clock tomorrow morning. All right, uh, I'll, I'll another lot. That one. Another lot. <laughs> yeah, <Grr. laughs> Had a good, uh, uh, good old session on uh, the uh, with Pete Williamson last night. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah, I saw your picture. It was, on there. It was a good old sociable laugh. Oh, good, good stuff, good stuff. Yeah, I have to have we, time off the computer. We'll we were a bit like the Capri Smash robots laughing about. <laughs> <laughs> it was a bit. Yeah, <laughs> it was lovely. Excellent, good. That's what it's all about, isn't it? Making mm. the most of what you can in these circumstances. Yeah, the accommodations look quite good, don't they, Rob? Yes, they do. Yeah. There's, there's, a a there's a replay you can watch, isn't there? So. Uh, yes. Yeah. Oh, what was that? I'm running up, Roger. What, what was that all about that last night? Uh, the uh, Cambrian Mountains in Wales. They oh, got, of course, uh, yeah. Got okay. some uh, sites there that uh, they're trying to yeah. open that for uh, these uh, night nighttime visits. Yeah. Okay. They look really it good. Was, sorry, it was also on Sunday evening on it the was, yes. Valley. Right. So, uh, the Astro Trail sounds interesting. Very. Yeah. Excellent. Ooh. There's lots, lots going on, and when we can get out and about, we can get out and enjoy some of what we see. Gosh, we got good, these things. good crowd tonight. Yep. We have yeah. got a good crowd tonight, and it's, it's creeping up. There's, there's lots of new names. Welcome, everybody who hasn't been in before. Mm. Good, to, good to see you Hello, all, everyone. Excellent. Hello. Yeah. Right. Shall I? Shall I crack on then, folks? You crack oh, on. Okay. Dave. Do my usual. Okay. Welcome along, everybody. Hope you're keeping well. Um, we haven't got much on the scribble pad at the moment, so go on to the scribble pad and introduce yourself, or put suggestions from meetings, whatever you like on there, and uh, yeah. Just share stuff because that's what it's all about. And thanks everybody for all the pictures that are coming on there. We've got some nice ones. Roger, nice Soul Nebula. Rachel, nice all said. And Ian got a nice uh, um, crab. And Nick, Mars and Eunice. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds painful. I know. <laughs> uh, again, thanks for all your gen generous donations so far. We don't need any at the moment, but. You know, if you do feel inclined, that's the address to go to. Yep. Okay, um, I've got a Sky Diary. And, um, when I get my mouse sorted, got a Sky Diary on Team Up, and it's changed slightly. Um, Steve Tonkin is now helping me with it. Um, so, and because it was getting a bit big and overburdensome, there's a blue one, which is the Sky Diary. So that's all the events in the sky that you can look at. Um, so if you go out in the garden, this is what you can see. You've got space activities and events. So anything like the Virtual Astronomy Club or um, Pete Williamson's events oh, done, eh? will go on there. And then space dates, which is this black one. And that's anything to do with anniversaries of space missions, etc. I'm gradually populating that with entries. So it's not complete yet. But Mike, if you spot anything that needs going on, let me know. I will uh, have a look at that, uh, Dave. Yeah. Yeah. Okie dokie. Good yeah. stuff. And that's stargazing.co.uk forward slash diary. Uh, so have a look. So, oh, we've got some things in, in the chat. Oh, evening, folks. Oh, just saw the ISS before coming here. Yeah. Oh, just okay. caught it at the end of it last night. Yeah, I saw that, Dave. Good. Yeah. I was a bit too slow getting the. Uh, wide angle camera taking images so it's about halfway all across clouds the sky. here yeah. all clouds and <laughs> rain yeah all clouds anyway looking at the meetings going forward 16th of february so that's the next meeting 
We've got Mary McIntyre talking about shadows in space and the stories they tell. Mm. And then 18th of February, we've got the live watch party. Hopefully everybody's got their tickets for that because we restricted it to 90 tickets because we can only get 100 people in live. A yeah. uh, but we should be able to live stream it on YouTube as well. Right. Uh, and if you, we've got some spare ones, Mike, still. Got it. Well, it got a handful of spare ones, yeah. So, right. so, if, you, yeah. so if you haven't yeah. got a ticket for it, let me know and uh -huh. uh, we'll get you a link so you can come in live rather than just. I mean, although we've got 90 sold, I mean, 90 um, registered, um, I'm expecting not, you know, less than 90 to go online on the time anyway. Yeah. So, you know, it's always best to check at the last minute if you want to. And they're all over the world, aren't they, Mike? That's right, yeah. So we've got some in the States, um, some in um, Asia as well. So uh, interesting, yeah. That's quite incredible. Excellent. Yeah. I got my ticket for the next launch for 2026. Oh, have you? Huh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've got my ticket, as you can see, and that's on. That's on. How many people on there? But something like about 11 million, isn't it? Something like that. Names. Yeah. So <laughs> we're going to be landing on the 18th of February. So come and join yeah. us. Mm. Um, oh, 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 there it is. So, oh, what time? Is um, second of March. Got a speaker volunteer. David Boyd said he's going to talk about imaging Uranus's moons. And on 16th of March, oh, Captain Rainer Evans is going to do exploring astronomy and space through philately. Oh. And then, as you know, 23rd of March is Virtual Astronomy Club's first birthday. Wow. I've managed to get a talk organized next month. Can you believe that, folks? Yeah. I've got a talk organized for that, The World According to Physics, and that's by Jim Al Khalili. Oh, right. Wow. In, oh, wow, wow. So, uh, great stuff. Well done, Dave. Yeah, well yeah. done. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, 6th of April, we've got John Thatcher, who I know from Bedford Astronomical Society, he used to be. Uh, member down at Bedford for a long while before he moved down to Shropshire, I think he's moved to. Yeah, you beat, you beat me to him, uh, Dave. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he he was one of the engineers that worked on the MIRI infrared camera. Yeah. Uh, he's going to talk to us about the Webb Space Telescope. And then we've got 20th of April, 4th of June, 18th of June. I haven't got anything organised from them for them yet, but if you've got any ideas, throw them forward. And uh, yeah, but I thought the uh, going through what people's journey worked quite well so if anybody wants to share their journey with everybody uh, their astronomy journey i think another meeting like that would go down really well mm. okie dokie so we come to tonight's meeting he's waiting in the wings yes he's still there thank goodness for that <laughs> yeah and it's somebody i met a, few, a good number of years ago and so did kev all those years ago and he yeah. took this picture ah when there was an Astronomy Now quiz, um, <laughs> when Astronomy Now was in its infancy, uh, there was a quiz and we were battling against Milton Keynes. And there we are, very young and fresh face. You look like a rabbit in the headlights there, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's because it's car broke, didn't it? Do you remember that? Car broke. I, I, uh, I remember that. that the bottom, it was in the magazine, Dave's car broke down. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, it's a so, recent uh, picture then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So there you go. So I met him all those years ago and uh, he's come to talk tonight. Nicholas Booth. He's on Twitter at Thieves Book. And he's one of the youngest. What was it? One of the youngest work for NASA. So he's been in lots of um, journalist roles and media roles uh, and writing a journal as well, as well as co-author of The Search for Life on Mars. Do you want to say anything else? About that, Nicholas? No, that's it. Some of you I recognise oh. because um, I gave a talk last year to see this is improved. Uh, that talk last year was so 20. This one is is looking forward to the two new or the three new missions that are just about to arrive. But yeah, I started out on Astronomy Now and then worked in newspapers and, and all my notes from 35 years ago from everybody I spoke to about Mars. So, you know, I knew it would come in useful and it has. Okay, so Nicholas is going to be talking about Perseverance and Hope Dispatches from a Red Planet. Thank you very much. Okay, if okay, people let's... can um, mute the microphones and uh, oh, most of you have already. Excellent.
So do you want me to try and share and my we'll screen? And we'll leave you to it, Nicholas, if you want to share your screen. Yeah. There we go. That should be it. That's it. Yeah. Can can you see that screen? We can. Excellent. Okay. Now the only the only slight disadvantage is I can't find my. Okay. Give me one second. I'm going to stop and go back into it because I seem to have called up the wrong. Um. There we go. That's what I wanted. Let me try and this screen here. Uh, as a former technology editor on a national newspaper, I have to say uh, I managed to be a complete joke when it comes to technology. So please do do forgive me. OK, I now need to go back to share screen. There we go. Can you see that screen now? Superb. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Um, we'll try not to shamelessly plug the book, but here we go. Um, I start, thought I'd start this off with I just did something that Stuart Atkinson, who some of you know, Mars Stu from the Junior Astronomical Society, he sent me that. He made an offering to the God of War, because as you can see, <laughs> Mars was at opposition this year, so it was very, very bright. Um, we are now, what, uh, 16 days away, so not this Thursday, the following Thursday, about nine o'clock. The heaviest machine ever that's been sent to Mars will come in and hopefully as you can see, they're coming through the Martian atmosphere, and it's the seven minutes of terror again. Um, the difference this time, because it's more or less how Curious landed in 2012, the difference time is this bit here, the radar lock and the terrain relative navigation, because the difference is computing's improved in the last eight years. They're using more autonomous systems because what they're trying to do it's the same of landing, it comes down, it fires the back shell, it then the sky crane drops, it off it goes. But at this stage here, uh, when it's about two and a half miles to the surface, it will pop a parachute at exactly the right moment because they're op they're aiming for a pinpoint landing or as much of a pinpoint landing you can do. Um, here's the target of where they're going to be trying to land. It's Jazeera Crater, it's an older crater. Um, you'll be a lot more of this picture in the next few weeks, so let me talk it through it very quickly. It's the edge of a crater. Um, it's been breached by water. You can see there, there's the flow. This is has imposed mineral observations on it, so you can see there's lots of interesting minerals there. And the aim point will to land is somewhere here, and we'll see a 3D representation of that. Jesus Christ. So it's going to be, we hope, it will land somewhere there. For those of you who know Mars, um, those of you who look at Mars through a telescope, sometimes you see the feature Certis Major, and there it is in terms of the of a map of Mars of the landing sites of the previous nine missions. So it's going to land somewhere on the edge of the come back to the minute. As you can see there, most of the landing sites on Mars are close to the equator. Um, the most furthest north is Phoenix, which is 2008, and on different hemispheres of the planet. And Perseverance, hopefully, will come down here in Jezero Crater. And what it represents is the best of all worlds. It's smooth enough because the lava flows, you know, Mars was volcanically active and lava flows covered most of the northern hemisphere. But Jezero, from estimation, seems to be one of the older craters. So by landing there, it's giving you the best of both worlds. It's smooth enough to be able to tra traverse but it's given you going back to the magic number of four billion years ago, which is the sort of big number that people want to get as far back in time as they can. Um, I said about the, the range triggering and popping the parachute at the exact moment. Um, here's how far we've come since Pathfinder in 97. There's where Phoenix and Insight came in, Curiosity. So there's the landing site about five miles or four and a half miles across. Uh, the end of the game is to get that down as precisely as they can and certainly all up missions, but I'll come back to that. Here is, for those of you who know your Martian geology, um, here is why Jezero has been chosen. So there's this vallis here, which is where the, what they're calling marginal carnates, because if you think about it, the atmosphere of Mars is carbon dioxide, the water there in the past, add water to carbon dioxide, you get seltzer. And in the mineral form, you've got carbonates. It's one of the very few places on Mars that carbonates have been seen from orbit. Uh, it's quite unusual. The rest of the planet, if there are carbonates, they've been covered with dust and you know, whatever's happened in over geological time. Definitely carbonates there. 
You can see here what they call the Western Delta. It's flowed with Muriel, there's olive there, and there's mafic, which is just a form of, of rock. There are a lot of sedimentologists, not a word you often say in polite society, but people who look at sediments, and they're very, very excited about this because in the ancient past, this water flowed, and um, we'll come through to that in a, in a moment. Here is Perseverance in all its glory. It looks like Curiosity, but it's in, all improved. One thing which it will do is it's got this little helicopter, which is called Ingenuity. That's carried inside that main box there. What will happen is about three months in, um, it'll be literally dropped to the surface. The rover will move out of the way and then it will take off. But the main difference between what the, the improvement between Curiosity and Perseverance are the wheels, which as you can see there, um, Here's the problem. On Curiosity, it's been climbing slowly up Mount Sharp on, in Gale Crater. And look at the wear and tear. Um, just the other day, here is one of the latest images. Look at that. The pointy stuff, as some people call it, the rocks have been piercing. So they've redesigned the tread and to make sure that the wheels will last. Because all it takes is a mechanical failure like that. And that's going to be the end of Curiosity, even though it's got power and can continue. Um, we have an interview in our book. He said plugging his book against this guy. The reason that that's called Pimp is Ride because he spoke in the young people's vernacular. It was quite funny. What they've done is they've had to completely redesign the, the tread and the, the load bearing, partly because Perseverance is about 10% heavier. I think it's 12% heavier than Curiosity. Here is just showing very briefly what the differences are. And saying technology has improved, it's got two new computers that basically check on each other, the wheels, new dimensions and tread. It's got 23 cameras, most are for hazard avoidance. Uh, Curiosity's got 17, so there's an extra six. Um, there's the cameras, and the main difference is this sample fishing system and every, all the fun and games is on the other turret. On um, Curiosity, there was a box there that was a third of its weight, which was called the sat the full analysis on Mars. And what that did, it had a couple of inlets to let the Martian air in and to drop samples and to heat them up. That's not flown on this mission. It's a totally different way looking at the Martian surface. This is what they call the bulk sample. What they're looking with the with Perseverance will be narrowing down for microscopic analysis of very, very small areas. I'll come back to that because one of the things that again, that you may have read in recent years which was a result of this instrument, which came as a, quite a shock when it was the front page of the New York Times science teams, was there's Curiosity, and you get a sense there in that box was the SAM instrument was making these measurements. And in uh, the summer of 2019, it found methane. Now methane is present on Mars in trifling parts per billion uh, amounts. The atmosphere of Mars is very thin, at the surface of Mars, it's the same pressure, six millibars, as it is 100,000 feet on Earth. So there's not much atmosphere, and trifling amounts of this are of methane. Now, the significance is, of course, methane is produced biologically on Earth, but it's not necessarily, the, it's not necessarily biological. This is going to be something that you'll be reading about and in quite a lot in the next few years. Unfortunately, Perseverance won't have the ability to take many more measurements of that, but it will be there sort of bubbling under. So methane is one carbon with four hydrogens and there are different isotopes. And there are certain forms of, of um, the isotopes of methane that are used preferentially by microbes, but that's not been looked at yet. That's going to be a very, very tough measurement to take. Here is what um, Curiosity's found. So methane in parts per billion, so it's blink and you'll miss them. And there seems to be some sort of um, annual cycle in the summer, and then it's building up, and then it goes. What does it mean? Well, nobody really knows the significance. They don't really know where it's come from. What's also interesting in subsequently to that is a team at the Good Space Flight Center actually built part of the SAM instrument. They've seen there's also the same kind of pattern with atomic oxygen. Again, 1% of the Martian atmosphere, it's not biological, it's not that you know, we breathe, but it seems to be following the same sort of patterns. So is it because there's something in, under the surface, is there some chemistry that's going on? Nobody knows. The big mystery should have been solved by the European Trace Gas Orbiter. Here it is. Uh, it works by using the sun as a heat lamp. 
uh, the sun rises from its perspective twice in orbit, and it should be able to detect the methane, except it hasn't. Originally, in 2019, after the effects of a, a dust storm, people thought, well, maybe it's because the dust is causing the problem. But last summer, and these are actual observations from one of the spectrometers, um, they found no methane there, but they found new carbon dioxide lines, they found new water lines, and new ozone, which may be eating some of the methane. So methane is going to, you're going to be reading and hearing a lot about it, but I don't think anybody really knows what it means. And it certainly doesn't look like it's biologically significant yet, but it's the potential one day you could measure the isotopes and get a better handle on it. You might be able to say, yeah, it's because the result of biology. Um, several people who we talk to and people who you talk to in the community of Mars researchers aren't, aren't convinced about there is actually methane. And there is a lesson from history, which is something i have called the talk from perseverance to hope really you know perseverance the little p and hope with a little h there's a lot of kind of wishful thinking that can go on if you don't you know don't make the observations um the story really goes back to 1969 here we are two weeks away from a landing and nobody knows whether perseverance will make it in the uh, in 1969 mariner seven there's a seven and there's a chomp of a solar panel one of the jet propulsion laboratory project managers a joke so well, you know, there's always there's this ghoul that hides space that bites spacecraft. I and mean, in fact, Mariner 7, the day before it reached Mars, uh, they lost contact with it, it went haywire because, um, you know, uh, probably a tree exploded. So there's Mariner 7, why a lot of people remember it purely because of the, this joke about the great galactic ghoul. 40% of missions that, get, that try to land on Mars only succeed, 60% have failed. So you know, it's still a very, very worrisome time for a lot of people. The observations that Mariner 7 made are a sort of lesson from history. This is from that same paper. The moral of this story is that spectral detection of methane on Mars can trick even experienced researchers and requires extreme care in considering spectral contaminants. So this was 1969. And what happened was Mariner 6 and Mariner 7 flew over the southern hemisphere of Mars as the best images from Mariner 6 and 7. Some of you there can see that that was actually a Les Mons. They didn't realize it was a volcano at the time. And over the edges in the kind of hinterland there between the South Pole and the, the plains there, it looked as though the infrared spectrometer had discovered methane. And at the time, we spoke to reporters who were in the room. It was 10 days after the first landing. Um, the chief scientist at the time said, We can't refrain from speculation that they might be of biological origin. And literally, people ood and ard in the press room. Problem was, it was a speculation too soon. They uh, you know, analyzed it properly and it went away. And this keeps happening. This is a story that does happen to do Mars exploration. Um, what's interesting is that that instrument there, the, the infrared spectrometer that was built at the University of California in Berkeley with the two scientists who built it, um, that was the first spectrometer to do that. And as we speak, a week today, its grandson, Voila, is going to arrive in Mars orbit. This is the uh, UAE Hope mission. It's got a series of, of new instruments that have been provided by American universities, and it will have greater acuity, better electronics, it will see. And it's really the next stage in the story of trying to discern information about the atmosphere of Mars. It's a remarkable story because five years ago, this it still hadn't been approved. It's taken you know, four years of hard work and then the COVID times even more remarkable for the UAE to actually develop this mission. And I say it arrives next Tuesday. Um, it was launched last summer from Japan, uh, from the Tanakishima Space Center. It's on its way. Everything seems healthy. I looked earlier at a report from the mission control. And this was just a very, very simple uh, diagram of what it will do. So next Tuesday, it comes into orbit. And it's in this long, going to enter into this long looping orbit, a science orbit. Because what it will do is have what they call the synoptic view. It's going to go far, as far away from Mars as possible, while well, it can still see things, to get the full picture to look at the atmosphere. To do that, it's got three instruments, which are, I call them the grandson of instruments that have flown before, provided by American universities, although to be fair, the UAE has worked on them as well. There is an infrared spectrometer that in this 
This dying year looks at the dust storms and water vapor, which is also present in the Martian atmosphere. There's a camera that will give a daily kind of synoptic weather photograph, or a series of them. And then there's an ultraviolet spectrometer. And it's what it's going to do is fit in a few gaps, because at the moment, the atmosphere of Mars, I made earlier, is like a, a series of onions. When you, open, when you cut open an onion, there's a series of you know, structures within it. And there's the lower atmosphere, the upper atmosphere, the outer atmosphere that's electrically charged. And trying to work out how they all fit together is still not quite a mystery, but they haven't quite got it all to sort of fit. Together. So there's still some fundamental questions. And that's where the permission comes in. Here is a synoptic view that was assembled from a series of observations. There's Mars, as you wish you could see it from Earth or a telescope. It's dusty. There's water vapor in the form of clouds. There's ice. And what the real lesson of the space era is, is the dust. Dust covers everything on the surface. There are dunes and dust gets absolutely everywhere. But at the moment, understanding how the dust gets into the atmosphere, how it then interacts is still a mystery. Um, when I was starting out as a young teenage lad talking to people about this, they said, well, we'll understand Mars because the physics is the same. So it rotates. So, you know, the hot air rises at the equator and it heads towards the poles. Uh, in the winter time, it's been measured that 20% of the atmosphere, carbon dioxide, freezes out onto the pole. You've got Kelvin waves, you've got tides, the dust storms may form predominant in the southern hemisphere. I'll come back to that. But even today, although it's simpler than the atmosphere of, of Earth, because there's no Earth to get into, there are still many fundamental questions. And that's really what hope is going to do, is to provide with all the missions that are there at the moment, particularly the MAVEN mission, uh, Mars Reconnaissance, to, to look at some of these fundamental questions. Here is Mars, as most of you know from looking through a telescope. This is the Lowell Observatory of all this in 1907. There's our Fresh Major, which a lot of people, the, you can see the problem is with Mars. It's a very small object, it's low albedo. There's not much to see because from the Earth, it's very, very difficult to see. And really, that's why you need to go there to look at this. So we've known there are dust storms. And in 1971, with Mariner 9, the first orbiter that went into orbit, it arrived at the same time as a dust storm. And then the dust drops out of the atmosphere, and then there was the shock that, with these spots, which are giant volcanoes. Um, that's really the modern era of Mars exploration 50 years ago. But even within 50 years, you know, there are still fundamental questions that have not been answered yet. Here's the most recent dust storm that most of you will recognize. There's a sort of composite of Mars, 2018. There was a dust storm that managed to fail the Opportunity Rover. It cut, it cut off a lot of uh, observations and it covered the solar panels, so the spacecraft died for want of their expression. And they're still mysterious. Nobody really knows how they're triggered. They know that it's dust and there's greater heating. Um, here is an example of a dust storm starting. What's quite interesting about that, you've got a cloud there. It's on the edge of the southern hemisphere. The orbit of Mars is such that it's quite elliptical, and at the moment, as in within the next 100,000 years or so, southern hemisphere points towards that point at the, at the near point um, at the perigee of the orbit. So it's the southern hemisphere that's heated the most, and we're talking relative terms here because the average temperature of Mars is about minus 60. But there's enough heat to kick up the dust into the atmosphere, and it's still not... In, is it chaotic because nobody can predict the computer models have bits missing so this is a game where something like hope is going to come and here is a sort of schematic which i won't even try to explain in terms of what's going on you've got lots of different processes that are going on in the lower atmosphere the hadley cell the heating their atmospheric tides and for those poor guys at the jet Propulsion laboratory this week trying to get a plan where perseverance will come in the atmosphere of mars balloons and and drops back again quite alarmingly. Um, so trying to understand that future missions is quite a big deal. You've got looking at this with the ultraviolet and infrared and then with air glue and all the different things, it's still a mystery of why and how or how these different atmospheric parts connect together. And to, you know, you can try and understand one, but it doesn't tell you about the next one. The instruments aboard Hope will hopefully do that. There's the infrared spectrometer which will look at the, if you like, the heat flow that translates particularly with dust and how that moves around. You've got the ultraviolet imaging, which is at the top of the atmosphere. 
um, which I'll come back to, and then you've got a camera, which will give the sort of weather snapshots, it, and it will fit in with all the other missions that are there. As I say, it's a series of, of jigsaws, and there are pieces missing, and hopefully the HOPE mission, in terms of atmospheres, will be able to help them understand just what pieces are missing and how, how does the atmosphere all fit together, and how do the different uh, parts of the atmosphere connect, how does the energy get transferred, how does stuff coming in affect it, still early days. The mission that's provided some interesting clues in recent years, which in a sense HOPE is working, working tandem with some of the same universities are involved, is the MAVEN mission. That's the Mars Atmospheric Evolution Orbiter. You can see it there, built by the University of Colorado. One of its instruments is this thing here, an ultraviolet spectrometer. And in Christmas 2017, it discovered the Christmas lights because there's aurora on Mars. Um, this is now the most layers of the atmosphere, about 100 kilometers high, uh, or outwards of 100 kilometers, where it's electrically conducting. The atmosphere is very, very different. But there are fundamental clues as to how the atmosphere of Mars has evolved. This is basically showing what MAVEN is, is looking at. You've got the sun, here's a schematic. Solar wind is coming off this cocktail of particles, smashes into the upper atmosphere. Mars has got what's called a remnant magnetic field. So there is the a magnetic field that was there in the past, but the core probably switched off. I'll come back to that. The atmosphere, the, the solar wind the energy slows down from supersonic to subsonic, that's the bow shock. There's enough energy to pull what they call there the ionospheric reservoir. It pulls the electrons off some of the atmosphere and throws it away into space. Now, how long has this gone on? Well, the, the MAVEN mission has shown significantly that the atmosphere of Mars was thicker in the past. And one of the fundamental things that's literally put the atmosphere off has been this interaction um, of the upper atmosphere in, with the solar wind. There's no protection on the surface of Mars from this stuff that's thrown off the sun. So here again, this was just shows quite dramatically. One day in September 2017, ultraviolet spectrograph sees this solar storm coming in, but today it's sort of there on the surface. Bad news if you're on the surface and you're trying to, to see if there's life, because obviously that will have affected things. But what the next sort of thing that people want to try and do is to tie in what Maven and hopefully Hope will say, particularly with the ultraviolet instrument, to see how the magnetic field lines and to watch material as it comes in, because what Maven's also discovered is like a wake behind a ship, the magnetic field sort of travels behind Mars. And what this is trying to show here, that the magnetic field lines crash into each other. They bash stuff out and they push stuff down to the surface. And that is really another ongoing investigation about Mars. Um, because here is something that is fairly significant. So there's a map of the surface of Mars. As you can see there, the northern hemisphere is mainly smooth because of lava, uh, the volcanoes that caused it. It's a more recent surface. Here is where the magnetism has been found, and you can see it jumps out at you on that. It's the older surface of the southern hemisphere, where there are the big craters, not just happened geologically. In other words, Magnetism was at its greatest between 3.8 and 4, 4.1 billion years ago. It seems to suggest that there may well have been a core that kind of switched off there. And the next big clue about this is coming from trying to understand on the surface what you're measuring with the magnetic field and trying to trace all the way down as, as stuff comes off into the sun, how is it affected from the interplanetary magnetic field? How does it go under the surface? And already the site lander that landed in November 2018, there's a very curious thing. Its measurements with the first magnetometer and magnetic instrument taken to the surface are out of whack with what's observed from the orbit. And the latest theory is that there are rocks in close proximity to the InSight lander that may well have remnants of ancient magnetism that are bumping up the signal. And we're talking about a factor of 100 in places. So it could be that there's rocks nearby to the lander that are seeing um, ancient magnetic signatures that they're picking up. Let's say what we're now trying to understand is so the atmosphere with Hope and Maven, what's happening below. Here is a picture probably you've all seen of the uh, inside lander, and that's the WOC, as they call it, inside of which a couple of size models, a British one and a French one. And again, as some of you know, it's 
observed about 450. Very difficult measurement to make because Mars is windy and this landscape got windier. Um, there's, you have to eliminate the wind and you've got to see what's happening and then the robotic arm has been moved. It should have been parked, but it spent most of 2019 poking the uh, heat probe, which hasn't quite worked, which I'll come to. And what they've shown is already that one of the sources for these Mars quakes is so insight landed here in the plain of Elysium, Elysium Planitia, and about something like a thousand kilometers away, Cerberus Foss. They've measured the Mars quakes, the seismic waves, and can work back where they came from. Here is, <coughs> excuse me, a photograph of Cerberus Fossae. <coughs> the Fossae is a name of it's like a sort of <coughs> crack in the crust. Mars's evolution was such no plate tectonics. <clears throat> Excuse me, there are no continents. There was volcanic activity and the surface cracked open. And what thing is that somewhere in one of the fossae, and this is Cerberus fossae, this shows individual boulders that have fallen off and fallen crashed down. Now they know from the measurements that the measurements they've seen aren't caused by landslides. They have would have totally different Kind of um, signature, and what they believe is that somewhere under there, and we're not talking San Andreas, we're talking about ancient lava flows that are still moving and there's still heat and the surface is peaking. Um, that's a pretty impressionment to be able to make. The problem that InSight has had, and most Mars missions do, I talked about uh, the dust, so there it was after it landed, here it was last year, and the dust has got worse. And there have been some terrible ironies with the inside mission, although it's been very successful. Um, where it's landed, odd things have happened in the sense that have never happened anywhere else on Mars. So, for example, this is from Opportune, I think it was, they've seen dust devils. So the dust spills around other landers and other rovers, the dust devils have literally flown over them and removed dust to, you know, so the solar power can increase. Not here, not in Elysium Planitia. Um, this was a simulation to show what happens as the dust load increases. Normally, you should be, it should be sunny like that. And as the dust gets into the atmosphere, the sun dwindles. And in fact, the site is now on about half the power it had originally. So there is, into this year and for the next few months, the you know, they're going to be very, very careful about what they can measure and which instruments they've got to sort of apportion the power to. Some of you know my recent opposition was one of the best in recent years. Um, you get a sense there of around about October. This was from a Japanese observatory. Mars, this was the latest image there, was January. The whole of the atmosphere of Mars is dusty. They watch the dust build up in the southern hemisphere, it's in the circulation, and now it's causing problems for uh, insight. There it is, it should have, so it dropped the seismometer. They had hoped that the dust devils might have, they've seen that dust devils have whizzed by, but not near the spacecraft for some reason. And as you probably know, the heat uh, sensor or the mole, they've finally given up. They, every time last year, they tried to pop this in, it should go to two meters and they take a measurement. Every time it went in, it popped back up. Anywhere else on Mars, it would have worked. The one place they needed it to work in, so it's a shame because what was needed or what is needed is to understand the interior. So there's the core, the mantle, the lithosphere and all this. At the moment, you'll get some of this from the seismometry, from the seismic waves and the modeling. You won't get the number for how much heat there is. And it's a shame because it would have been an, an interesting uh, number to be able to refine the models. Insights an extension for two years. So it's got the money and the more observations it takes, the more accurate it will be. So within two, three, four years, the scientific papers will come out going from this kind of guess of how big the core could be and how long it would have been active for, because then you can measure back and look out and estimate how it would have been in the past. And that really, in terms of the interior of Mars, brings us back to where we were looking outside in the 19th century, when people quite happily put whole seas and oceans on Mars, with irony, really. Um, one thing that can still happen today with space missions, so here was the first mission in 1965, Mariner 4, shot past and was zoomed in and he showed you the distance, how far we've come. There's Elysium, they didn't know there were volcanoes there, they were just known to be a feature on the surface. Mariner 4 had the first set of digital camera to get in close to make observations. 
there's Mariner 4, the kind of Model T Ford, the first successful Mars flyby, 1965. And there's a famous image, the very first image, there's Mars, there's the atmosphere with dust and, and probably clouds in there as well. And it found that, this, that that part of Mars was just cratered and that was overnight, Mars went from being red, the red planet to the kind of dead planet. But here's the kicker to that. Here is where Mariner 4 flew and those photographs came in and it quite by accident missed all the interesting geology. So we've got the three volcanoes and Olympus Mons, the largest uh, volcano in the solar system. And the point with all this is, even today, we might still be missing things, there are still missing pieces that, that we've, we've not found yet. The big space mission that really got me interested in the whole thing was Viking in 1976. The aim was to land and take observations and look for life. Um, it was a great space mission. It was brilliantly executed. Here's the orbiter that went into orbit around Mars. It dropped an aeroshell inside, which was the Viking lander, which was probably the most complicated mission ever built at the time. So it was a lander with a tripod, so it would land whichever way. There's a, so there's a sample arm there. That instrument there was a weather arm, a weather instrument. There was a high gain antenna, and there were two cameras. For its time, it really was mission impossible, and they got it to work. Um, and here just shows you again how we've come. Now you can look on at the highest instrument on the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter and the surface of Mars with a greater view than Google Earth. In 1976, it printing photographs off and sticking them on a wall. Because when Viking got there, its cameras were better than the previous Mariner 9 and the atmosphere was clearer. And what was that look like? Their land site looked a bit rougher than they thought. So what they had to do was to take lots of photographs and the big names, there's a young Carl Sagan, Mike Carl from Leeds originally, Harold Mazursky, and they counted craters to work out which of the landing sites might work out. One of the reasons that Viking worked was because of this guy, James Martin, who was a sort of steely Martin and wouldn't put up with any nonsense from anybody in some of the interviews in, are in our book. The reason for showing this is that the Vikings had this orbit like this, where it was a long looping orbit that the periapsis, the near point, and it kept having to be moved to try and find a landing site. Now, the reason for showing you this is because in on February the 10th, so not next Tuesday, next Wednesday, the Chinese Tianwen mission will arrive and will have a similar sort of orbit, and it will take in its periapsis to a landing site that it will look for to, to be able to find where they want to, to, to land their rover. But I'll come to that. I said Jim Martin wouldn't put up with any nonsense. He made sure that before the first landing, there was consensus, and he only got that by getting people to vote, to say, yep, because he didn't want the scientists afterwards saying, well, we weren't quite sure. But he, they all sort of agreed, and it worked. And there's the famous photograph. Quite interesting about that is it was a facsimile camera that built up the picture blind line, and even though you can see on this side of the picture, there's still dust moving around. And there's a rarity, there's Jim Martin, very happy in the champagne for two former NASA bosses. Oh, sorry, uh, Jim Fletcher was the NASA boss and there was Tom Payne who'd actually said OK to the project. Viking was very lucky. The, even the best images in those days were something like 20 metres, which is what, 60 feet. So Viking 1 landed and there about 30 feet away was a rock that they christened Big Joe. And they you know, had no idea, but it landed, it was safe. The second one landed and the meteorology instrument there produced what I think is still the greatest weather observation ever recorded. And this is an actual photograph from when it was stuck up in the press room. The crystal planitia, as it was known, light winds from the east in the late afternoon, changing to light winds from the southwest after midnight. And that's how it was done in 1976 by Seymour Hess. Um, the most recent observation from insight um, was at the end of last year uh, because of the because of the power problems they're not sending as many observations in real time but Elysium Planitia so the weather hasn't changed that much but one significant thing that insight has which has been elusive is actually making wind measurements on the surface on Viking they knew the spacecraft was shaking around um, and the wind they've got quite good at predicting 
Uh, but most missions since, including Curiosity, they've had problems with the wind instruments, trying to make a, a measurement of what's happening with the, the, the wind, because it's a significant factor in how much wind is needed to pick up the dust below the atmosphere to cause um, global dust storms. Here is the first photograph from the sea. You can see there from 1976, the summer thereof. There is the shadow of the um, meteorology instrument and Viking dug a trench because it was sent to Mars to drop the samples into the hopper and using an absolute amazing instrument for its time. The most complicated thing about the size of a gallon, uh, gallon milk car, they had three very, very fancy biological instruments. Two basically looked to see if there was life that would be like terrestrial life that might adapt to Martian conditions. And a third one was sort of unequivocal, could tell you whether there was life or not. 10 days after it landed, the first sample was taken and you can see there the labeled release and it worked by humidifying the sample, giving it what they call chicken soup, which wasn't chicken soup, it was a radioactive lactose. And if there are any, um, microbes in there, you would see you know, a sort of strong signal. And on the first run, there was a strong signal. And again, that story's in our book, because when that was printed out, one of the scientists looked and went, oh my God, it's positive. And the, as it was announced, there's Gil Levin who built that instrument. I mean, you can tell by his face, he's excited. So that really is somewhere where we've been that one group, their instrument basically tested positive but nobody else believes that it did. Um, that was one of the newspaper reports from the time, the caution, because as Jerry Soffin, who was the project manager said at the time, too much too soon. There was too much activity that couldn't be explained by biology. At the time, the problem was nobody understood the basics of Mars, the chemistry of Mars, and there is the actual blackboard where they tried to attempt to do that. Um, you've got energy coming in, and there's peroxides, there's rusty dusts that are coming in, and trying to understand the surface of Mars. And it's still something today that is causing people to scratch their heads. In those days, it was like the simplest way to do it is Alice in Wonderland, where Alice sees the chess game, because you're trying to understand what the rules of the chemistry and physics are, but you don't know what the rules are. The guy who built the paralytic release experiment, which worked in a different way, Norm Horowitz of Caltech said, one word was worth a thousand picks and the word was no, because his instrument didn't find any signs of life. The problem was that you had one instrument that said, well, we might have found something and the other said no. And at the end of the day, it was the kind of been in a wilderness of 40 years of life, neither proved nor disproved. Now, since Gil Levin, who I interviewed a number of times when I was in newspapers, he still is saying that life was discovered and all you need to do is send a, an advanced version of his instrument to check that. He's a voice in the wilderness. 2008, and there's a wrinkle to this story, which I think is quite curious. Um, the Phoenix lander came down and the White House was briefed, so you always know in the sci-fi films that that's important. Because the uh, Phoenix lander came down in the very north in a place called the Green Valley, which is very strange because it's not green and it's not a valley, but there it was, it landed. Again, just to remind you of the landing sites, there's Phoenix, 67 degrees north, as near to the North Pole as they could get it. So it's colder and surprise, surprise, it found ice. Now the ice had been observed uh, at the poles at the first time it was discovered under the spacecraft. Uh, and that's quite a significant thing because if we have water, there's greater chances for life. So there was probably lots of water in the past. It dug a trench and there was ice and it's proved what people had known for many years. There's a famous image from Viking. Even a five-year-old could say splat because something hit the surface, it splatted, it, there's water under the surface and it caused that crater that then is frozen into place. Here is the instrument that the Phoenix uh, lander had and it measured the soil, so the two couples and found interesting stuff in which I'll come to. Now this is the grandson of the one that was built for Viking. It has been ready for launch in 1976. And there's the guy who built it, Klaus Beiman of MIT. And he looks like Elvis there, but he was quite well known as a sort of dapper chip. His instrument did not find any organics in the soil. There's the actual paper where they reported that, on the Chrissy where Viking landed, Viking 1 landed, you'd be a, you'd be a Planitia. In none of these experiments could organic material. So in other words, 
even though one of the instruments, the biological instruments, seem to suggest there was particularity, there's no organics, there's no long chains of carbon which you life would be formed from. So if there's no bodies, you can't really have life. And that was the consensus from Viking, a very, very simple term. Um, Phoenix to Pample, it discovered a couple of things that's quite curious and because it was colder and they were more pronounced, chloromethane and chlorobenzene. Now here is a map of Mars from uh, the Mars Odyssey of looking at chemistry using a gamma ray experiment. And you can see there chlorine. Now in the Viking instruments, they found chlorine, but at the time they thought, aha, that is the stuff that we've used to clean the instrument. Because as you send up a spacecraft to Mars, you've got to clean it to make sure you don't discover the life that you've taken to Mars by accident. So it's known as chlorine. Where does the chlorine come from? There aren't any you know, kind of swimming pool dependence. It comes from meteorites that landed on the surface. And here's why it's significant because there's a chlorobenzene, with a, which is just a ring, and we'll be hearing a bit more about rings in a bit when I talk about the Perseverance mission, with a chlorine attached. So these chloromethane or a benzene have been found. And again, it doesn't, it doesn't mean much when you look at it like that, but when you think that within the ring there, there's carbon. So again, you've got a carbon hydrogen and you've got a chlorine there. If there's no organics, where did the carbon come from? So in simple terms, the 2008 men has produced a, a sort of a, a genie out of the bottle, which is this. There could well have been carbon in the form of chlorobenzene and chloromethane that I saw, but they, it has one unusual property. If you up, it sets on fire. And it could well be that in the observations that Viking made, here they are, good old fashioned microfiche, that there could be, um, organics that were found, but people didn't realize it at the time. And what a group of scientists led by a girl in Paris, Melissa Guzman, who's at one of the universities there, are trying to recruit to find out, well, actually, there could well have been organics in the Martian samples. They just, because chlorobenzene, it, it was literally smoke, you know, went into smoke. So it could well be that this is going to be an interesting um, line of reasoning that will you know, become more into the next few years but really the main thing that's happened in recent years as well as the meteorites the rocks and bars that which organics have found in the summer of 2018 organic matter found including its possible biosignatures found by um, curiosity so for the first time for 40 years in the wilderness now we know there are organics on mars and that's why people now are sort of talking more about the possibility of life it's not just going to be an American uh, enterprise anymore as the Chinese Space Agency. They're, you know, they've got a very aggressive program of missions to the moon, to the rest of the solar system. And last summer it launched the Tianwen Orbiter on the Long March 5, uh, which as we speak, now my Chinese characters aren't that good, but you can see what's happening here. There's Mars, and let's say next Wednesday, the Tianwen Orbiter will arrive in Mars. It's a bit like the good days of the Soviet space program. They don't tell you in advance what's up, they tell you all the good points and usually after what's happened. And there's quite a few sort of de detective journalistic who've pieced together quite a lot of this. Um, there's Mars coming in its orbit. Tian one will go into orbit next week. It will spend a couple of months in this sort of uh, reconnaissance orbit with a near point where it's going to pick a landing site because Tian one has a lander. And the spacecraft seems to be in good health. This was uh, released about two weeks ago. Um, they've announced what the sort of instruments are aboard the spacecraft. So it's an orbiter, magnetometer, mineralogy, and these papers will come out and they'll work together within uh, you know, the scientific community to, to reveal more about what, what's with the Martian atmosphere. Sometime in April or perhaps early May, they will release their capsule. There's an animation of it, but there's not much information on when or how it will be done. Um, here is another map of Mars, which again is actually quite more dramatic as it shows you the relative heights of things. So it's from a laser altimeter. Um, there's no sea level, there's very low points and higher points. And you can see there, that's very dramatically why most missions land um, in the Northern Hemisphere. The Chinese Tianwen lander, the rover will land in Utopia, but it's a vast region. And Viking 2 landed there in 1976. 
Um, they've released an image that they've said they're going to go for five, basically were well, the last chance of the global dust storm kicking up because of local conditions. On board Jupiter is a high resolution camera about the same as the high rise instrument on the Mars Reconnaissance Orbit. So it should be able to see down to about 25 centimeters on the surface. They've released a picture of where they want to land. Uh, it didn't really tell you anything because there's no scale on it and that's an image, but you can see there's ice uh, and there's wind features within craters. So it's a pretty remarkable mission if they can get it all to fit together. Um, the lander will land like that. There's a series of uh, rails. The lander will come, the rover will come down. It's about the same size as Spirit Tunity. I'll come to that in a moment. There it is with its own instruments, similar to the ones on Perseverance. Um, will they release pictures in the real time? We don't know. But that will be into the spring, probably May, when if it lands and it falls off, fine. Then there'll be a few photographs and, and pictures that will come through. They released this. This was in the undersurface radar. This was in the Go Desert. Um, they finally released the kind of dimensions of it. For those of you who are interested in those sorts of things, as I say, the, the size of that bus with those six wheels is very similar to Spirit and Opportunity. And I'm in this slide just to show you how far we've come in 25 years. Pathfinder, the first rover, was the size of a microwave with legs on it, with wheels on it. There is Spirit and Opportunity. That's the size of the Chan uh, rover. Also the Examars, the, the Rosalind Franklin one. Here is um, the giant, if you like, weighs a metric ton, is Curiosity. What all the rovers have shown is something that's been suspected for a long time, is the water, because water is key to understanding the climate of Mars, understanding what happened on the surface and the possibility of there being life. The problem has been for many, many years, the geologists can't find the evidence that the climate modelers say should be that. If there was a thicker atmosphere, there might be rain, there might be different features, they've not been found. But gradually the two are coming together. And you'll hear in the next few years, the history of water, because it's been on back in billions of years, there was enough water four billion years ago. And as the atmosphere degraded, the water would have evaporated to space. One of the interesting things that's come through in recent years is the idea that some have said there might be a, an ocean in the northern hemisphere of Mars. And it's quite curious because uh, somebody book and they said, some days I think it's a really great idea, other days I think it's silly. There's no consensus as to whether it was there. You will hear a lot more about this because where the ExoMars, the Rosalind Franklin rover will come down is on the edge of where that ocean might have been. But increasingly the next few missions will try to find a little bit more about this and what could have happened. So here we're going back very quickly to Curiosity. It came in its landing ellipse in Gale Crater at the center of which is this giant Mount Sharp. And you can see there what was in, said in that scientific paper, mudstones. As it's gone up into the hill at the center of the crater, it's found evidence for obviously where water has flowed and eroded at the surface. Here is a high resolution image, it takes a while to load, taken at the end of last year showing where uh, Curiosity is now. And it's really quite significant because down here, you've got rocks that are mainly um, caused by or created uh, as mudstones or clays where water has been on the surface and heated. And then above that is a region that's predominantly sulfate. And what that suggests is 3.8 billion years ago, the atmosphere of Mars changed significantly from having enough water around to cause, to be able to have mudstones to sulfates. The, the minute the, the water chemistry changes because there was sulfur coming out of volcanic eruptions and it changed, it's a sort of threshold beyond which life can't. Um, so you've got to go back beyond 3. Point billion years. Uh, last year, the Curiosity lander rover found this, they're called Tal Soka. It's absolutely remarkable. It's the same morphology as stuff that you see in deserts when there's been water. And indeed, they suggested that the, a lot of the forms of this are like the deserts in Altiplano, which is where the water doesn't run off to the sea, it just evaporates. Now, all you need to do with that is add, and I took this photograph in Iceland, is of a geyser, uh, is a hydrothermal activity. 
So you have hydrothermal activity, you've got water on the surface, you've got the right chemistry, you've got a magnetic field that will protect you from all the stuff coming off the sun. And that in very simple terms is why in 40 days and sorry, 16 days time, uh, Perseverance will land here because all those things might have been present in Jezero Crater in the ancient past. Here's how it's different from uh, Curiosity. It doesn't have the chemical oven that can you know, do the bulk samples, but it's got an instrument called Sherlock I'll come to. They contrived an acronym for Watts and a camera, and there's an X-ray spectrometer. And all the interesting stuff after the landing will come when, they, when this starts going through its passes. Sherlock is uh, an acronym for scanning habitable environments with Raymond and the long involved Acronym. What it will do is shine a laser at very, very microscopic levels within rocks. The fluorescence that comes back at different wavelengths, you can check and see, um, you know, are they organic? Are they signatures that are on the way to biology? It's a very exciting time and it will be the instrument that will probably lionize um, press. Sherlock, there we are, after Sherlock Holmes himself. We have a long interview in the book with Luther Beagle. Uh, I can make the joke that the Beagle will have landed and like the one that the British didn't. Uh, he's the lead instrument developer with let's say, a long interview. And he's looking very excited. And he said, you know, one of the reasons with Sherlock Holmes is because as Sir Arthur Conan Doyle said, how often have I said to you when you've eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable must be the truth. They will go through everything to eliminate what they might see before they stand up and say, we think we might have found biosignature. Here is how it will do that at the front end. This shows the pixel instrument, which works by a shower of x-rays and the results are, it will tell basically what the elemental composition tot up all the different elements there. Whereas Sherlock will look at the actual, the configuration of the chemistry, a very exciting instrument. Um, the great little touch that it's actually taking a piece of Mars back um, from the Nat Natural History Museum in London. It's a, a Mars meteorite that landed in 1999 because they'll test it. There's actually nine test instruments to calibrate the instrument because they want to make sure that the level that they're firing the lasers, it's a very, very small area, that it's not misalignment or there's not a problem. They can run the experiment of Mars. They can then fire instruments at one of these samples and then back in a laboratory, they can double check that what they're seeing is real. Because if there is life on Mars, there's any evidence for life, it will be very, very convoluted and not really obvious. Uh, and they don't want to obviously make a mistake. Here again is why Jezero Crater has been uh, chosen. There it is, carbonate, where signs of life might be found. Now there was a press conference last week where they showed some pictures. This is slightly breaking the thing. They, they said that, but the reason why you want to land where there might be carbonates, because there's a mineral form, is because that's what you would have had on Earth in certain areas where the minute that you have carbonates, it entombs any microbes that might have evolved and you'll still find them today. You're likely to find them in these, again, from the NASA conference. There is a stromatolite, uh, the, the most ancient life that's been found on Earth for about 3.5 billion years ago. It's not beyond the realms of possibility that if all these things line up, there might be similar things like that on Mars. Here is the landing site. This is from the US Geological Survey. And here is the fundamental problem. It lands and they're hoping to be able to go through the crater and through the wall. You do not know with any mission you send how much time you've got. It might only work a week. It could continue beyond there and the scientists wanted to carry on continuing because the more observations they can make. Say so three weeks, sorry, three months into the mission, they'll drop the helicopter, which will take on, and that will be really interesting. There's a little camera, um, and this will be, you know, in the future, that will be a significant thing. If you've got a helicopter, it can look at where you're going. So for the minute, we are, you know, 16 days away from seven minutes of terror. Um, I just wanted to end with my great illustrious career and also to talk about a few themes. I started in 1987 on Astronomy Now. This book came out a year later when Dave Eagles calmed down. Um, that book came out because there was a space spectacular, the Phobos mission, the Russian one. Unfortunately, both failed. To say, you, 
exploring Mars is not for the faint-hearted. I followed that up and that was when I was doing stuff for newspapers, mishap prior, anything that could have gone wrong did go wrong with that mission. Uh, four years later, the Mars Observer spacecraft, that was lost. I've been to PR many times there, pointing at a uh, camera in the rover. I decided to collaborate with Dr. Elizabeth Howell. She's probably the most, uh, probably the best science journalist or certainly space journalist writing today. She is been to Mars, or she's been to the one in Utah, and I'm very jealous. Um, she's been reporting, and between us, we've covered Mars for 35 years. So I'd like to think that we've got everything that um, the kitchen sink that we could put in to tell a, a story. The ExoMars may have been delayed, partly because of the coronavirus. When it gets there, the difference is there's the lander, the Russian built lander. It can go one way or it can reverse and go the other. Again, it's about the same size as Spirit and Opportunity, and it's built in Stevenage. The problem that they've had is with the parachutes. It doesn't have the fancy sky crane. It comes down on the biggest parachute sent which will be sent to Mars. In tests in 2019, rips appeared, and if, if they knew that it would fail on Mars. They thought at first it was the ejection mechanism, so they've been in Oregon shooting these parachutes out, because what happens is a drogue pulls one parachute out, at a certain altitude it's dropped, and then a drogue pulls another to slow it down. And the most recent stuff I've seen is they've had rips in the tests, so, yeah. There may have to be a fundamental redesign of a parachute. As I say, it's not for the faint heart sending stuff to Mars. Here is where we are, uh, what we're going to be doing in the next few years, a space agency graphic that makes something really exciting, boring, but let me just go through it quickly. Mars 2020 lands, trundles around. In 2026, there will be the sample retrieval, which will be a joint NASA ESA mission. It will land and then will fire a surface up, sorry, a pull from the surface up to and back, probably by 2030. It's very, very complicated. Um, I have the slide before and I use it, because the Bond villain says there's two ways to disable a crocodile. You can shoot it or put your hand in his mouth and pull each of his teeth out. And getting a sample back from Mars is exactly the same as that. You can't just say, oh, look, there's the Earth and fire your sample. There's lots of individual steps. Uh, in recent weeks, an advisory body has looked at this and said, OK, we think all the elements that you want to do are in the right order. The problem is, here is Perseverance. It lands. It will take these samples. Do they keep them on the rover? Because if the rover then suddenly stops working or there's a problem, you can't get them off again. If you drop them onto the surface, what happens if they're covered in dust, and, you know, if you can't find them? So there's lots and lots of individual little pulling the teeth out of the crocodile steps before we get a sample back. Just weak, the landing ellipse there, and there is the extended mission target. So the, here, what that's showing is the blue is where Mars 2020, the Perseverance rover will go. In six, seven years time, the green one, the, the sample, the fetch rover will follow in its steps to try and pick up the samples and who knows where, nobody knows how long. Be. So it's got to make sure that it lands really, really precisely because they don't want to waste two years traipsing after a, a, a rover. Here is the latest version of the Fetch rover. All it's got to do is travel three times faster than existing rovers. Again, that will increases in technology to be able to do that. It probably will be built in Stevenage. You've then got to fire a rocket off the Martian surface. Exactly the same problems you have down with the atmosphere and the automatic uh, transfer, you've got the same going up because you can't do this in real time. Mars is too far away. So all this has got this docking and the sample will have to be done autonomously. Um, and then bringing it back to another series of uh, appointments to come. Will they do it? Yes, I think they will, but it might not take, it might not be all in one go. So I realize I've been slightly over time for which I apologize. But everything I know about Mars and everything that Elizabeth knows about Mars is in the book. Um, thank you for letting me whitter on. And as I said to Dave, if anybody wants a signed copy, we can figure that out. But thank you for letting me talk tonight. And I hope you've enjoyed it. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, Nicholas. Excellent. But when you see the um, picture of people standing next to Curiosity, just realise just how big that is. 
and how they managed to get it down in that sky crane is just makes it even more impressive. Yeah. Anybody got any questions? You should hold on. Let me allow you to unmute yourself. So just unmute yourself if you've got a question. Oh, well, good. Yeah. What's the SN10 is ending? Yeah. I thought it was SN9 that was going up. Send talk again, Nick. Thank you, Mike. It's the all new improved talk, obviously, because it's yes. got more. <laughs> yeah. More things have gone on since uh, we last spoke. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, perseverance is exciting because I say, you know, it, it's a th the, the press last week. They said I, it was originally going to land about eight o'clock our time on next Thursday. Sorry, yeah. Thursday after next Thursday. I th now we're at 8.50. So, you know, right. we can have our tea and what, uh, yes. I, you know, to to be checked but it will be you know the evening uk time yeah and the minute it lands that fires the starting for the run mission because they they can't hang around for that so it's quite an exciting time yeah we'll be there yeah we'll look forward to that one so anybody got any questions for nicholas yeah could i just make a comment uh dave john of course john, of course, john. Just a small correction. You said uh, Beagle didn't land. We now know Beagle did land. Sorry, yeah. It, it, the ground it, software yeah. did start and something yeah. happened. Yeah. yeah, sorry. I, uh, um, For reasons I won't be with, I, you know, I wasn't a great fan of Beagle, but that's another story. Um, it did land, but it was it, somebody on Twitter said, well, it was an operational success, which um you know yeah um well, but what, go that far. <laughs> i mean <laughs> compared with well, if, you, uh, if you talk to civil servants they do speak in, in news speak so but there we go um the point i was trying to make is it's tough to that yeah and absolutely. they have and it, it's um i mean here we are 16 days away from perseverance because it worked last time all it takes is a margin or something and something could go, you don't, but they've been fairly confident because of the increase in the, the technology. So what I should have said with Beagle was it did land, and I think the Mars Reconnaissance uh, uh, the, the high-rise instrument so, took a photograph where it showed half a solar panel opened or whatever. So no, to be fair. I'm pretty yeah. sure that three of the solar panels opened, and it's not right. exactly yeah. whether the fourth one part opened or not. Right. I'd stopped reporting by then. So, you know, it was in that kind of grey period after I stopped reporting. So, no, no, I totally agree. Uh, it was only one. It's really difficult landing on Mars, no doubt about it. Yeah. It's been, it's been enough it's mainly because, Yeah, it's because of the atmosphere. The atmosphere is very, very. It gives you the, the two worst things that you've got. One is it's there's not enough atmosphere to open a big parachute. This is why ExoMars has got the problems. Because it's got to open in a different way, and it's it's thin enough because you need to take into account. But you've still got re-entry, and you've got and the EDL, the entry, descent, and landing is, you know, it, it turns grey overnight because it you can't predict half of what's going to happen yeah. with the atmosphere. It's there, but this autonomous software should be able to work out. What, you know, it's looking for a point on the surface, and it can tell it can then override and then. Um, Hopefully, it will do that. You know, fortunately, in 2006, the European Scarelli lander, uh, it already thought it had landed because its sensors were, its motion sensors were swamped. So it's reset itself, thinking it had landed. So that's why its engines didn't fire. So, you know, again, it's, it's tough to, you know, there's all these strange things that will happen. I, you know, that's why they, they talk about the great galactic pool. It sits there and it gobbles spacecraft. Uh, I have a quick question, if I may, Nick. Um, yeah, sure. Why, why do they delay the launch of the helicopter for so long? I mean, I would have thought it would be the first thing they wanted to try out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I th um, they need to make sure that the... Oh, here we go. Ah. Right, carry on, oh. folks. I'm just putting it up on the screen in case something happens. Carry on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah um, moving swiftly on. Um, the... <laughs> The, the, the sort of, I th the, again, it depends on how when it lands and it everything's tested, and everything works out. And it, it's they want to, to drop the helicopter off 
further away from that kind of cliff thing that you you saw just in case if it takes off there's a slight problem and it sort of ends up bashing into the cliff that's that's my reading of what's been been right. said i don't think that would, um somebody who's actually involved with the ingenuity helicopter could tell you more but it's just to make sure the spacecraft is working and everything and it's still trundling across the surface and then it will let's say it could be, be dropped um and then off it will go the other instrument that's quite interesting which i showed a picture of the moxie um it's the thing that people have been talking about science fiction for years is taking the atmosphere um, and using it like a fuel cell in reversal to use oxygen uh, and water from the atmosphere to be able to, you know, if you build a base for fuel and also, um, you know, if you want to live there, that you can get live off the land. Um, so that's the other, again, I think, I can't remember when, there's, there's a schedule of when they're going to do things. For the first few weeks, it's the engineering they want to make sure everything's working um and also i think one of the feelings is let's get up to a rock as quickly as we can and fire off because you you're only a failure away from it not work um you know that could happen on the first day it might i mean curiosity going now eight years um all it takes is one of those wheel problems to then suddenly cause big problems and then the mission's got to stop so trying to maximize as much as they can uh, as quickly as they can. Thank you very much. Quick question. Is it perseverance that has the the drill at the front that is supposed to go down? I think it's about two meters. No, that's sorry, that's ExoMars. I should have said that. That's the, ExoMars. Okay. That's ExoMars, yeah. Um the perseverance works by just firing lead beams and x-rays and stuff it gets really up close personal and looks at the reflection the exomars the rosalind franklin drill that will that's because so it turns and it will go into the surface hopefully two meters now two years ago two meters people thought what's, what's two meters everybody now knows two meters right because of the uh because of covid it's quite interesting because we, we to some of the engineers and one of the things is we all you know Insights had all these problems of things that you can't anticipate. Uh, what happens if you get, if the drill gets hooked? And they said, well, we just, you know, we just detach it and we lose, the, we lose that part of them. What is interesting, the, the SAM, in, the big box that's got all the bulk sample chemistry stuff, uh, a miniaturized version of that is, in, uh, is on the ExoMars body of the spacecraft. And it will be able to not look under two meters, where some people are saying you need to dig that far to, to find stuff that's you know not been bombarded with radiation to kill it. But also, it will look at some of the properties of that, that using the fancy chemistry that they were called derivation agents. So they take a sample, heat it up, attach things to it in the chemical, not quest tubes, and you look at what comes out of that, and it will tell you if, for example, the chiral molecules. Um, so, in other words, we know some molecules are left-handed, some are right-handed, and if you saw lots of amino acids that were in a different condition, you'd know one, that was Martian, and two, you'd know it was indigenous, you'd then know, but that, again, the chances of being able to do all that in one go are pretty remote, but the possibility is there. The, the other thing that, that, again, is in the book, when we talk to people, they've said, look, you know, why spend all effort and all this money doing this? sending your kitchen sink to Mars, just as the samples, and we can look them in the lab. So again, that will be, that's why people are excited because the stuff will be returned and hopefully people will see, um, you know, be able to analyze the stuff and see what the biosignatures and what the steps are. Yeah, yeah, so it's an exciting, yeah, 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 exciting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nicholas, yeah. Just, just moving back to the uh, um, helicopter, what's going to be coming out. I presume they've yeah. looked at this, but uh, when the uh, sky crane's lowering and it goes on to rockets and it gets to the sort of uh, last few sort of metres, uh, have they looked at sort of uh, rock and dust being sort of uh, kicked up to prevent the uh, mechanism sort of working to be able to drop it? Because I'm not know for three months. Yeah, I, uh, yeah, well, they'll straight away when it's landed, if it's all in one piece. Um, they've looked at the, 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 the biggest problem they've had with trying to see if the, the helicopter will work is to simulate the atmosphere of Mars. 
Um, because you can say, okay, it's like here at 100,000 feet. So they know it will fly at that altitude because they've done it in a, in a big wind tunnel. They've just literally evacuated. Uh -huh. But the, it sits, yeah, it sits inside this kind of frame that it's, if you want to have a better expression, it's, it's anchored. And so no matter what happens, if it's, you know, being messed, you know, being shaken around, um, the, the, the mechanism is, I'm trying to remember, it's a, a sort of series of bolts that just fly open and it literally drops to the right. surface. I think it is. So that, another reason is they want to make sure, again, that, they, that if there's any dust or debris nearby, you want to get away from that. Mm. So I think, say, it, it, the, it's the engineers will say, OK, here's the road test, here's the keys. You do with what you want. Yeah, really interesting. But I think they take... Yeah, if it were, I mean, you know, again, even if it doesn't work, it's still the idea that yeah. they're trying to do it. I mean, again, yeah. it shows you that image of Pathfinder, which is about, you know, the size of this desk with six wheels on. And now you, you know, I could imagine, I mean, when I started writing about the works of Mars aeroplanes, Mars balloons, Mars, you know, whatever, the, the ability to, to do that. And one thing that they're talking about for the way to the far future is if you can fly, you might even be able to fly and land in the polar regions, which and then take your sample and get out of there as quickly as possible is yeah. recently my Mars. Um, so it's a technology demonstrator. If they can get this to work in the future, there'll be more of these. They'll be more ambitious. And, you know, can you imagine that, you know, a drone across Mars, it'd be amazing. Keep his fingers crossed for that. Yeah. Yeah. We're only a few minutes away from launch, apparently. Any, any more questions for How, how do we get hold launch? of the book? Pardon? How do we get hold of the book? How do you get life on Mars? Link on the, on the Virtual Astronomy Club website at the moment. Yeah. Okay. Um, what I'm saying to people is, well, Mike's got something on his website, um, I can, uh, a link to it. I use bookshop.org, which will take you to your nearest independent bookshop. If you want to pay for Jeff Bezos to go into space, then use Amazon. Um, anybody wants a signed copy? So Elizabeth's in Canada. I'm here. We didn't want to send books across the Atlantic, <coughs> so we've signed bits of, you know, sticky to paper that I buy John Hancock on. If you let Dave know and he emails me, I can, you know, I'm quite happy to just put those in the book to you. Um, and it's also now available as an audio book. So uh, a Canadian actor has wasted at 17 hours of his life in our words, which is fine by me. So there's an audio book as well. If you wanted that, you can download that. And it's also Kindle. Um, but if you want a physical copy, look on bookshop.org or, you know, you just do the search for my name uh, and look on Dave's website or look on Michael's site and you'll, you'll see it there. Okay, thank you. Okay, brilliant. Oh, so we got a three minutes to count. We got three minutes to launch. I've just stuck it. Can you, you see that? Okay. You see that? Yeah, that's fine, Dave. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Is that time for one more question then? Yeah. yeah go on. Sorry, sorry for Kevin. I, I just happened to notice on one of the instruments, it said the air pressure on Mars was um, 1,024 something. And I thought mm. 1,024 sounds very much like pressure down here. And I assume no, pressure, yeah. pressure on Mars is no, a lot that... less. Yes, the I can't remember what that that was. I'm trying to remember what the thing is. The average t pressure on Earth is a thousand millibars or one bar because there's a thousand of them. On Mars, it's millibars. It can go as high as six millibars. So the way of explaining that is, if you have got a ladder of a hundred thousand feet, that's the same pressure. And as I say, there's not much atmosphere, but there's enough. To make a spacecraft design, I have to sit up and notice to be able to to, to build that in. So it, it's a very thin, reedy atmosphere. The other interesting thing, perseverance, which is something I've been wanting to know about for years, is what Mars sounds like. And it's got um, a, a microphone. So for the first time, there've been microphones before. The problem is they haven't worked or they crashed. Um, the problem is with Insight. It's solar panels rattle and they've re they've sort of simulated that, but it's not a microphone. It's what, you know, it's the sound that would cause that. So for the first really, you know, Mars has been a silent movie. So for the first time, the mass cam, the Z, which stands for, for Zoom, um, it's gonna be full, you know, HD, UNA, IMAX. I mean, there's gonna be an IMAX movie, which will be amazing from that. And there'll be the sound for the first time. So 
Mm. I think that yeah, is miles. And it will the simulations are because there isn't much atmosphere, but there's a lot of dust that it you know, will be will it will be a lot of noise and things impacting onto the microphone because of the dust particles. Hopefully, it'll be a lot of noise in less than a minute. Thank you. So yeah, absolutely. Right. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna pop the sound on now, so we should be able to start vehicle. hearing what's going on. Let's hope it's not a rud this time. Let's hope uh, Starship 9 doesn't crash into Starship 10. Yes. Yeah, that, my very thought. <laughs> so, so, same here. <laughs> be like a game of Skittles. <laughs> Strike! <laughs> No fun, you guys. Everybody likes oh, to see things blowing up. Oh, it's gone. There we go. Ten, nine. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Oh, yes. goodness sake there's always one <laughs> i can report it's still going up it's nothing's happened it's still flying i'm watching yeah, it on sure. yeah, yeah, yeah. if you go back to the tim dodd feed he's still showing it is, is it does anyone know what the flame was beside the main rockets that didn't look right i think no, that's about... definitely an error so let's go back to where we were earlier oh come on don't hurry up Still going up. That's <laughs> it. I'm using up. No. Oh, for goodness sake. <laughs> I think those little flames are, look like to be sort of uh, little sort of rockets, which is sort of uh, changing its uh, direction. Well, you, you normally swivel the main engines for that, don't yeah. you? Yeah. On the well, hydraulic. Exhaust. Oh, yeah. the oh, there we go. Oh. Magnificent guys, I can't even tell you. Oh, that's a better shot. So far. Yeah. Okay, and just shut down number two. So now they're basically throttled up on just one engine now. This is this is intentional. I did forget to start our clock. I'm sorry, Andrew. I totally forgot. It's happening, guys. This is This is the beginning of the future, my friends. I think we're going to stick it today, guys. How are you guys feeling? Let's do this. OK, so I don't know. Wow, it is, it is so far up there. It's just crazy. So again, this is only going to be flying up to 10 kilometers. And then it's going to be turning off its engine. Today, oh, there is. That was a large flash. Wow. It is so high, it's so hard to see. Is it hovering at this point? Has it stopped moving? Uh, yeah. Yep, so at this point, guys, it's actually just holding at Apogee. It's just sitting there around 10 kilometers in altitude. That seems about right. That seems about right. So it's actually just going to hold there until it drains its fuel enough. And then at that point, it's going to do a kick 
it's going to come down and land or and work on coming down belly first so it's literally at this point just hovering maybe doing a small translation it, uh, Ryan is it actually moving left and right at all a little bit so it's it, but it's not going vertically yep so it's actually just hovering at apogee at this point it's literally just holding its position uh, at apogee of 10 kilometers so 33,000 feet and what it's going to do so right now you can see, it looks like it's moving sideways it's not it is actually just it's just completely stationary right now wow okay here comes the kick getting ready for the kick I think get ready for it guys so what it's gonna do is it's gonna use okay, it everyone I'm gonna go here we go here comes the flip Hi, Rachel. Oh, that is awesome. See you soon. Good, All right, good now it is in free fall, Sorry. my friend. Oh, wow. This is the belly flap. Oh, that is cool. Thanks, Nick. Oh, that looks like it's See really you soon. nose down this time. That Thanks. is really nose down. Thank you very much, Nick. Thanks a lot. It's fixing. It's fixing, though. So it's likely it likely did that to translate forward a little bit. So highlight the flip, Kate. Yeah, it's just doing its belly flop now. Holy cow, guys. It looks like it's it's kind of going back and forth a lot. Oh, that is so weird when it gets silent. That is so weird when it gets silent. Oh, I can see it now. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> guys, take it. Look at it with your eyes for a second. It's right here, Kate. It's, it's a lot lower than you think. Look at that. All right, Gene, get ready to, to track this now. This is, it's doing it again. They're absolutely doing it again. It's right over the launch pad. It is right over the launch pad. This is absolutely perfect. Oh my gosh, guys, this is insane. This is, I, oh, I can't even describe it. It's like, it's right over the launch pad. It's, it's actually, yeah, I hope it goes a little bit more, uh, more east. I think we're good. Here we go. So it's going to be doing that flip any second. It's going to relight two of its Raptor engines. It's going to use those Raptor engines to help it flip. It's, just, it's going to do this kick flip maneuver. It's right on target, guys. It's right on target. It's looking fantastic. Here we go. Engine relight. Engine relight. And there's the flip. Yes. Oh, God. Oh, God. No. 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 That was a bit of a flip. <laughs> it didn't flip. Almost. Not again. It, good job it didn't take the other one out. <laughs> exactly. Well, bit close. I know they're supposed to dock, but way. not like that. <laughs> Ow. <laughs> You'd have thought they'd fix the software by now, wouldn't you? You would have. Woo! <laughs> What a shame. What a oh. shame. Going to Mars, everybody. <laughs> yes. Yeah. How are they going to get it to Mars? Oh I want to know what happened. I want to know what happened. Gene, let's get you zoomed in. Get it to Mars. It just won't go down. They said landing on Mars was dangerous. Yeah. <laughs> it perhaps needs fitting with a sky crane. Yeah. yeah. Or airbags. They just yeah. flipped it a bit too far. Yeah. And then immediately they seem to do this though. They, they seem to leave it right till the very last minute and then start to flip it rather than flipping it a bit higher to give it that opportunity to sort of reorient itself for landing. Yeah, yeah they didn't flip it soon enough. They probably don't have the fuel. Yeah, they, they, so, some computer has worked it out. You see, he was saying earlier on they're burning off fuel. So, yeah, it's probably designed in the same way, you know, the way when they land the Falcon, whatever the other stages are. Yeah. That they, they're designed to, they sort of, they kiss the ground at zero, with zero fuel, because they can't hover. <laughs> and that's probably the no, same. They probably burnt off enough fuel, and the thing is designed like that. to flip. Mm -hmm. they're supposed at the latest was possible point. To do a damn day landing. Um, there's 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 very little fuel in it when it lands. That would be a guess from somebody who knows nothing about rockets. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, same Just need same to give a twelve-year-old a joystick. They'll do it. Uh, <laughs> they'll, do that. they'll land it. No problem. Over. 
wonder if Mexico will be getting some more illegal material like uh, they had last time. <laughs> That's why the FAA decided to uh, hold their license for a bit. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> brilliant. Very good fun. Oh, dear. Excellent. Wow, what a finish to the night. Ah, <laughs> yeah. Went with a bang, Dave. Uh, hey. with a bang. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> excellent. Yeah, all well, the best. I'll, I'll send Nicholas an email to... Uh, Say thank you for tonight. So again, great night, good fun, good to see yeah. everybody. So uh, thanks everybody for coming in. So yeah, I'll call it then. So uh, you know what I'm gonna say? Yeah. Keep safe, keep well, and keep looking up. Keep looking up. up. Thanks a lot, Dave. Thanks a lot. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. I don't know where my end has gone. Ooh. <laughs> I've lost the end button. <laughs> it keeps <Ooh>. disappearing. <laughs> it disappeared on the launch pad. Gone up in smoke. <laughs>